One of my patrons was asking if I could go into more detail about Allied colonial forces during the Second World War, and talk about where the troops came from, what battles they fought in, the reputation of the units, and so on. But it's such a broad question that there's no way I could cover all the different forces in just one video. So instead, I thought I'd focus on the biggest colonial force that the British had, the British Indian Army, and ask how effective was it? How good or bad were the troops within it? And were the Indian soldiers as capable as the British soldiers they fought alongside? These are the questions we're going to try and address today, so let's begin. Out of all the levies, rifle corps, guides, rangers, camel corps, militias, military police, defence forces, frontier forces, and other colonial armies, the Indian Army was the largest of the imperial formations that helped the British Army protect the empire. British officers and NCOs recruited, trained, and led most of the colonial formations, but the manpower in the units came from the local Indian population. Now, yes, let's get the elephants in the room out of the way. Racism was an element of the process. In Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka, Indian villagers watched African soldiers bathing in the hope of glimpsing their tails and people actually fled areas near to African camps for fear that they would eat their children, convinced as many were that they had been brought in to eat the Japanese should they land. I decided to place this quote here because I wanted to show you that it wasn't just the British who were racist at this time. The Indians were just as racist as the British were. But you see, there's two competing narratives here, isn't there, Whoopi? One which says only white-skinned unhumans can be racists, and that the only reason these whites conquered India and Africa was because they wanted to enslave non-whites, and that this is all a racial war between social racial groups. While the other narrative is that the reason the British went to India was because they wanted to be rich and that when they got there, they decided to conquer the place because that made economic sense. And then they governed the uncivilized natives whilst trying to civilize them and improve their lives, an attitude which came from Christianity and classical liberalism. Yes, things didn't always run smoothly, and racism was a part of the process, but they didn't go there to enslave non-whites, since Britain was the first nation in the history of humanity to actually abolish slavery, and went around enforcing this embolishment on other nations. I know which narrative I believe in, the one with the evidence that supports it, but you can believe whichever you want to believe. Don't let a cisgendered white male tell you that you're wrong and make you run to your safe space. <laughs> Emotions. But yes, racism was a factor. So while India wanted to fight against Axis aggression, many in India also wanted freedom from British rule. And it wasn't just British rule, but Indian rule as well, because as a consequence of the Great Depression, many nationalist Indians were against the Indian capital and labour classes, or races, who had benefited from British trade and industrial policies. So there was an intra-racial conflict going on here as well. In September 1939, Gandhi argued that Indians should cooperate with the British during the Second World War, because he believed that the British could be negotiated with, and believed that the war would destroy imperialism. Others, though, believed a more militant stance with Britain was in order. One Indian nationalist leader, close to Gandhi in 1939 but split with him a year later, was Subhas Kandra Bose, who refused to cooperate with the British. He called for a synthesis between fascism and communism. Later in the war, Bose went on to help found the Indian Legion in Germany, then led the Indian National Army in Japan, where he also founded the Provincial Government of India. And Bose was killed trying to escape to the Soviet Union in 1945. So I'll let the fascists and the communists excuse their way out of that one. But all this leads us to a question. Why would ordinary Indians want to fight for the racist British? 
they weren't drafted, the British Indian Army was a volunteer force, so Indians willingly took up arms for the British. But why? Well, there were several reasons. Some were unemployed looking for a job, others joined up for king and country. Others wanted to escape the inflation as well as the food shortages that occurred in India during the war. More wanted to learn valuable skills, becoming signalmen and mechanics, which would place them above the competition after the war. But the general consensus is that most of these recruits joined up for personal gain rather than for patriotism. This was a bad thing, as it shows that the Indians weren't really passionate about fighting for the British or against the Axis. There is evidence that the nationalist movement was more attractive to those Indians passionate about the political situation. Nonetheless, the ratio of British officers in the Indian Army fell dramatically, going from 10 to 1 in October 1939 to 4.2 to 1 by January 1945. The British, meanwhile, feared that the Soviets, initially allied with the Germans, might move into and through Afghanistan or send long-range bombers to strike targets in India. The northwest frontier of India was therefore under threat. The British knew that they had to use Afghanistan as a buffer state to protect India from Soviet aggression. And when the Axis and Soviets carved up Europe, it looked like the British Empire was on its last legs. Italy entered the war in 1940, so Britain had no choice but to pull out forces from Singapore as well as India, fundamentally weakening her forces in the Far East. The British mistakenly believed that the chance of war with Japan had receded, and that the probability of war with the Soviet Union had increased. Seeing British weakness, the Afghans also sided with the Soviets, refusing British arms while signing a trade agreement with the Soviet Union in July 1940. This, ironically, actually confirmed to the British that the Soviets weren't intending to invade India via Afghanistan. But that didn't stop them agitating. The communists in India were on the side of the Axis Soviet Pact, and they promoted civil disobedience, national strikes, and a policy of no rent and no tax. This was all designed to impact British capitalism in India. But then they completely changed their tune when the Axis invaded the Soviet Union. Overnight, they suddenly became supporters of India's war with the Axis, proving that they have no spine. Yes, Marxists now joined in to help capitalism. What a joke. But going back a little bit, when the German blitzkrieg overcame France, there was some panic in India with heavy withdrawals being made from the banks, and the general fear was that India might be attacked. Gandhi had to make a statement telling Indians not to withdraw their deposits. Your metal buried on the ground or in your treasure chests need not be considered safer than in banks or in paper if anarchy overtakes us. That's bad advice there by Gandhi, and most Indians seem to ignore it. As the currency began to inflate due to the central bank printing more rupees, people withdrew cash from the banks and even closed their bank accounts. Police had to be brought in to control the crowds outside the banks, and people bought land, food, gold and silver to protect themselves, fearing a hyperinflationary crisis. Later, people fled from eastern India, thinking that the Japanese were coming, leading to labour shortages, a fall in rental income in the cities, and an increase in rental income in the smaller towns and villages, plus an outbreak of cholera. At the height of the panic in early April 1942, over 55,000 workers, almost 25% of the total industrial workforce in Bombay, were reported absent. No fewer than six special trains were running every day to cope with the exodus. Special buses with extra rations of petrol were stationed at various places to facilitate the movement of people. Merchants began moving their stocks out of Bombay to safer storehouses in the countryside. Agitating peacefully, Gandhi was arrested by the Raj, 
spiking a massive rebellion which destroyed 332 railway stations, 208 police stations, 749 government buildings, 66 trains, hundreds of sabotaged railway and telephone lines, and impacted the supply of Allied troops. The workers weren't happy, but neither were the communists, who condemned the rebellion, because workers of the world unite, but only when we tell you to. History repeats. Now, there was a famine in India during the Second World War, but I don't really want to get into that today because I intend to do a video on it in the future, which will no doubt get suppressed, just like my Greek famine video did. But arguably, the main cause of the famine in India, just like in Greece and elsewhere, was the inflation policy of the central bank. The famine in Bengal of 1943-44, which resulted in perhaps 3 million deaths owing to starvation and disease, was the extreme manifestation of the problems triggered by inflation. It is also the best studied. As Amartya Sen has famously argued, the famine was caused not by a shortage in the availability of food in the province, but by the drastic reduction in the entitlements, the overall ability to obtain food, of the Bengali people. This, in turn, was primarily due to the war-induced inflation. Sounds similar to what happened in Weimar, Germany. Anyway, Indian sympathy to the British cause was heightened after the fall of France and the Low Countries. It was felt that the Axis and the Soviet menace were as much a concern for India as they were for the British. The political situation came to a head in 1940 after Churchill gained power. Upon setting up a war advisory council in India, the offer was made to the Indians that a constitution could be drawn up after the war, and so the British invited the Indian leaders to confer amongst themselves about who would be the representatives of the Indian people, who would then write up this future constitution. That kept them busy for a while, allowing the army to get on with the war. Now, at the beginning of the war, India's army wasn't prepared for it. There were only 194,373 men in the entire force in October 1939. Mostly trained for internal policing work, plus the Indian general staff were believers of outdated concepts of warfare. The Indian army had been 573,484 men strong in 1918 and would end up growing to 2 million men by the end of the Second World War. Therefore, massive expansion was about to be underway. General Auchinleck and others started to modernise the Indian Army, which was given three tasks, internal security, external defence and imperial duties. Thus, not all of India's army could be deployed outside of India. In December 1941, when there were 600,000 men in the Indian Army in India, including British commanders, half of these were still in training, and half of the remainder were for internal security. So, there were only six Indian Army divisions at the time inside India that were capable of being deployed in combat, and three of them weren't ready yet, and really only the 17th Indian Division was actually fully prepared to fight. There were another 300,000 men elsewhere, though. Two Indian divisions were in the Middle East at this time, three in Iraq, which was counted as separate to the Middle East for some reason, and more besides. But India itself was barren of troops. At the start of the war, there were only eight anti-aircraft guns in the whole of India, and no fighter aircraft at all. Signals equipment was scarce, and while India did supply the men, its relatively small industrial base was incapable of supplying the equipment for them. So Britain had to supply the equipment, which wasn't great because Britain itself didn't have much equipment to spare. Plus, getting that equipment to India wasn't easy. As a consequence, the forces raised in India and sent abroad were chronically under-equipped and reliant on all manner of patchwork solutions. Thus, the 4th and 5th Indian divisions deployed in the Middle East, tank country par excellence, did not have the requisite complement of anti-tank regiments. 
even in March 1942, there were only two fighter squadrons in eastern India equipped with Hawker Ordax biplanes. Calcutta was completely defenseless. But reinforcements were being moved to India, including the 70th British Division, which barely arrived in time to plug the gap after Burma fell to the Japanese. By September 1942, the Eastern Army had one British and five Indian divisions and a tank brigade equipped with Valentine tanks. But the British were running out of Indians to recruit. India was divided into classes or races, and the martial class or martial race was rapidly depleted thanks to the expansion of the army, so the British had no choice but to recruit from other classes. Even though the Punjab and the Panthans of the northwest frontier province were just 7% of the total population, they'd been over 48% of the army prior to 1939, with the Punjab accounting for the vast majority of that. Sikhs provided 17.5% of the army, despite only being 1.4% of the population, and the Muslims provided 34% of the army from 23.5% of the population. The other 32% of the population, all of which was Hindu, provided just 3.7% of the manpower for the army. This, of course, changed during the Second World War. Massive new numbers came from southern India and from Bengal, which hadn't had any representation in the army prior to 1939. The traditional recruiting classes still contributed the most and had the highest proportion for the size of their populations, with the British continuing to use the martial classes on the front line, relegating the non-martial classes to support and rear services roles, but a shift had occurred. Expansion meant that a large number of the new Indian troops had little basic training, in direct contrast to the professional Indian army of the pre-1939 period. By December 1942, there were two British and six Indian divisions, while one Indian armoured division and five Indian infantry divisions were in the Middle East. More divisions were being recruited though, and at the end of 1942, the Indian army stood at 1,550,000 men strong. It was then decided to sort out the equipment shortage, and from early 1943, shipments were increased, so that by the end of the year, and certainly by mid-1944, they had made up for their shortfall. Most British officers in the Indian Army started their career by attending the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. Thus, they were as well trained as any other officer in the British Army. Many wanted to go to India for adventure or more responsibility, but only the top 60 officers who passed at Sandhurst could apply to go to India, so competition was fierce and only the best officers got to go. In addition, Indian officers were trained at the Indian Military Academy at Dera Dun and were considered to be better trained officers than their British contemporaries because the British put their best officers in charge of that school. Again, this was due to Indianization and the idea of civilizing the colonies. The 4th Indian Division ended up in Africa in 1940, fighting the Italians along with the British. I've already done a documentary on Operation Compass, so it's probably best just to watch that if you want to get the details. But the British force under General O'Connor had just two divisions. The first was the 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats, and the other was the 4th Indian Division. These two divisions, totaling 31,000 men, immediately faced six Italian divisions and then more divisions behind the lines for a total of 150,000 men. Now, the Indian division ended up being pulled out halfway through the operation to be sent to fight the Italians in East Africa, and this sort of makes sense because the Indian army was well versed in mountain warfare as a result of the fighting it had done previously on the northwest frontier, and there were mountainous regions in East Africa. But it was also a controversial decision because General O'Connor hadn't been informed beforehand, and it robbed him of a division right in the middle of the battle. He later said that this decision cost him three weeks or more because the Australian division that was to replace the Indian division 
wasn't ready. Nevertheless, the 4th Indian Division worked well with the British Matilda tanks in the initial stages of Operation Compass, and had contributed significantly to the best British victory of the war. The results of the battle speak for themselves. A British force of never more than two divisions, one of them armoured, with a proportion of corps troops, advanced 500 strenuous miles and totally destroyed an army of ten divisions for a loss of 500 killed, 1,373 wounded and 55 missing. The captures were 130,000 prisoners, 180 medium tanks, and more than 200 light, and 845 guns of the size of field guns and above. This was the best victory of the war for the British, and wouldn't have been possible without the 4th Indian Division. Then the East African Campaign and the Battle of Karen especially showed the strength and skill of the Indian formations. The 4th and 5th Indian divisions moved across mountainous terrain and crushed the Italian units that were of better quality than the ones the 4th Indian division had faced in North Africa. The Italians did put up a spirited defence, but the Indians overcame it. The Battle of Karen showed the importance of the pre-war training of the Indian Army, particularly in mountain warfare and night attacks, that helped defeat a numerically superior force, even though it was equipped as a mechanised force, rather than for mountain warfare. I've actually been reading into the East African Campaign in preparation for a future Battlestorm documentary on it, so I'll leave the details until then. Same applies to the rest of the North African campaign, since the last video I did on that campaign was Operation Crusader, before I got bogged down in Stalingrad. Well, when we pick up and go further through the North African campaign, we'll see more battles where the Indians took part, but as an overview, the 5th Indian Infantry Division didn't perform too well during Rommel's second offensive, or at Gazala, and to be fair, most of the British units didn't do well during those battles either. However, about 95% of the total casualties among the Indian units during the withdrawal from Gazala to El Alamein were due to being missing or having surrendered. This suggests that their morale and will to fight for the British cause had collapsed. The lacklustre record of Auchinleck, the senior most Indian army officer, as well as the Indian formations that had been plucked out of the Middle East, cast a long shadow on Indian forces in North Africa. Francis Tucker, 4th Indian Division's commander, felt that their performance had been so disastrous and had so shattered the prestige of the Indian army that it can never recover in this war. Even though the 4th Indian Infantry Division was moved back to the front line after having been sent to the rear in early 1942, this may have been why they were subsequently relegated to a minor role, thanks to Montgomery. Montgomery expressed the view that the British officers in India weren't very good, but this might have more to do with the fact that Monty had applied to the Indian Army and had been rejected because he wasn't good enough. So bitterness soured his view. Monty only gave the 4th Indian Division a minor role at El Alamein because he believed it was only capable of holding the line. The exception was the 5th Indian Infantry Brigade, which was given to 51st Highland Division and contributed significantly to Operation Supercharge. General Tucker, though, knew that he had to restore the name of the 4th Indian Division and told his troops that at the time. I've told my chaps there to fight as if 4th Division had no name at all, and was starting now to make it. I've absolute faith in them. It appeared to those at the time that Monty only viewed the Indian troops as worthy of garrison duty, or second-line troops, which is why he left them behind at El Alamein to clear up the battlefield once the battle was over. I'm not sure if this was purely because of his perception of the failure of Auchinleck and the 5th Indian Division's poor performance previously, and his inability to get into the British Indian Army in the first place, or if this has to do with prejudice and racism. This is something I need to look into in the future when I get to it 
in the Battlestorm series. But the fact is that the 4th Indian Division was a very experienced division and was well suited for desert warfare. So after his men were left to clear the battlefield of debris, Tucker complained to Brian Horrocks, his corps commander, saying that his men weren't being given the proper role they deserved. Horrocks passed up the complaints to Monty, who ignored them. Later in March 1943, when the Axis decided to hold the Marath Line, 4th Indian Division was finally given a major role in a battle under Montgomery. But at first, its two brigades, the 5th and 7th, since the 11th had been previously destroyed, were split up and sent to different units. So took a complaint to Horrocks again, offering his resignation and stating that it was pointless having a division commander if there was no division to command. Tucker ended up having tea with Montgomery himself, who finally allowed the mountain-trained 4th Infantry Indian Division a chance to concentrate for an attack. The Marath Line was the first time since El Alamein that the British would have to face a determined enemy force. After one initial engagement, the Axis Line fell back to the Wadi Akarit Line. This was a natural defensive position, but wasn't fully prepared by the Axis at this point, so there was a chance for the British to take it. Monty drew up the attack plans, but Tucker and Wimberley, 51st Highland Division's commander, weren't impressed by the plans at all. So Tucker suggested a different plan, which Monty accepted, although stated to a staff officer that he didn't like it when people disagreed with him. Monty has got a bad reputation in the eyes of many, while others hold him up in high regard. I am reserving my judgement of him until I've gotten further into the Battlestorm North African campaign series. But I think it's worth remembering that the British had previously suffered major defeats when facing the Axis in North Africa, and Monty's tactics had seemingly changed things around. The 4th Indian Division, though, and its commander, weren't in agreement with the new ideas. Montgomery had transformed the 8th Army from a shaken and dejected force into one with strong cohesion and morale. This was because it had begun to win its battles. Montgomery had achieved this by adopting the methodical set-piece battle, relying on attritional firepower and careful movement rather than dashing manoeuvre. This, more or less, served the 8th Army well, as the string of defeats had ceased for good. Most of its formations adopted and adapted to this approach and largely prospered. However, Montgomery's approach never really sat well with 4th Indian Division. The 4th Indian Division was trained for mountain and manoeuvre warfare as well as nighttime attacks. So even though this was meant to have been a set-piece battle, the 4th Indian Division attacked earlier than the other units, moving under the cover of darkness to surprise the enemy. Lovett's 7th Indian Infantry Brigade snuck up to the Italian Pistoria Division's lines and the Gurkhas charged. Numerous positions and prisoners were taken, a Victoria Cross was won, and a five-mile gap had opened up in the Axis lines. The rest of the British infantry forces then attacked later, but the British armour failed to bring up their armour, and thus the victory that the Indians had won was lost. There's a debate as to why the British armour didn't materialise. It could have been because of Axis attacks, miscommunications, congestion on the poor roads in the area, a few 88mm guns that prevented the tanks from moving forward, or Montgomery wanting to fight a set-piece battle the next day rather than exploit the gap now. Whatever the reason though, the point is that the Indian 4th Division's troops had performed exceptionally well and were well versed in both nighttime attacks and mountainous warfare. The Battle of Wadi Akarit of 6th of April 1943 was probably 4th Indian Division's finest hour. Using bold and, by 8th Army standards, innovative tactics, they smashed the Italian division in front of them, tearing a five-mile hole in the Axis line. For a moment, it looked, at least to 4th Indian Division, that the whole 1st Italian Army was there for the taking if the 8th Army's Exploitation Formation 10th Corps could pass through the gap that they had cleared. 
10th Corps never did, and therefore the Italian slash German army withdrew from the Akarit's position in good order to fight another day. Thus, the battle is little known. The same principles about mountain warfare and night attacks apply to the Gothic line in Italy, where the 4th, 8th, and 10th Indian divisions, along with the 43rd Gurkha Lorried Brigade, assaulted the Axis defences. But the Indians lacked experience in fighting in jungles, which is why they suffered heavily in Malaya, Burma, and at the First Battle of Arakan. In the jungles of the Far East, the British and Indians found themselves getting outflanked and surrounded by the Japanese, who seemed to move through supposedly impenetrable jungle terrain, forcing British units to fight their way out of encirclement. Then, in early 1943, they came up against Japanese defensive positions at Don Bake. At first, the British repeatedly threw their men into battle six times and got beaten back each and every time. After the guns fell silent 50 days later, the battlefield looked like the First World War Western Front, with two sets of trenches, a no-man's land, and lots of mud and destruction in between. So, during the monsoon period of 1943, the Indian commanders came up with solutions to the problem. It was only now, in June of 1943, that jungle warfare became a formal part of their training, which was described as a revolution due to its effectiveness. But even the trainers had little experience with jungle warfare, and had to recruit Jim Corbett, a 68-year-old big-game hunter who had hunted numerous tigers and other animals in the early 1900s, in order to train the trainers. A book on jungle warfare doctrine was published for the 14th Army called The Jungle Book, which obviously gave the soldiers the bare necessities to fight in jungle terrain. Frank Maservi, someone you might recognise from my North African campaign series, had been transferred to the Far East to take command of the 7th Indian Division. With the training he had received, he now ordered his men to infiltrate and encircle the Japanese positions rather than assault them head on. His patrols managed to do just that, cutting off the Japanese from their supplies and forcing them to withdraw. After this success, Harold Briggs of 5th Indian Division ordered his men to do the same, and sure enough, they overcame the Dombake positions. A similar situation occurred at the Battle of Razabil in January 1944. The British attempted frontal attacks, failed, then decided to use a more indirect approach. At the Second Battle of Razabil in March 1944, the 5th Indian Division sent one brigade to simulate another frontal assault, but sent the other through the jungle and outflanked the Japanese positions, capturing Razabil Fortress. Overall, then, the British Indian Army went from being little more than an imperial police force in 1939 to a very successful professional army by 1945. Their training and development of tactics led them to excel at mountain and eventually jungle warfare, as well as nighttime and maneuver attacks. They fought and helped to overcome the Italians, the Germans, and the Japanese. So, while some might class this as a colonial army, the frontline Indian infantry divisions proved themselves equal to, or indeed better than, many of the British divisions at the time. And Indian soldiers were as capable as any other British or Commonwealth soldiers of the war. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.